Good to go, Paul. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this uh, second session of the UFO, the University's Federation of Animal Welfare Virtual Animal uh, Conference. Uh, now we will start uh, with a session with uh, four different uh, talks. Each talk, as you may know already, uh, will be of about 15 duration time, and that will be followed by a 10 minute uh, discussion and Q&A uh, part. So we really appreciate all attendees raising any questions, so feel free to uh, pose those either using the chat or the, the question box that you have on your panel. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure uh, to start and be chairing this session, so I uh, acknowledge you for, for inviting me to do this. And uh, with no more uh, introduction, I would like to uh, invite the first uh, presentation to go on, which is uh, from uh, Kate Lewis uh, in University of Portsmouth in the United Kingdom, that will talk about uh, risk factors for strategic uh, behavior in captive ungulates. So uh, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all enjoying the conference so far. Thank you so much to you for for inviting me to speak to you today about our study, which examined the risk factors for stereotypic behaviour in captive ungulates. OK, so it's probably best to start with some basic definitions before we go in further, any further. So firstly, what type of animals are we talking about when we use the term ungulates? Well, ungulates are a diverse group of what are primarily large mammals or with hooves. Oh, and um, cetaceans, who actually share an ancestor with hippos and are therefore technically ungulates. But in reality, we generally exclude these when we use the descriptive term ungulate, and that's what I'm going to do here. So we keep ungulates in a broad variety of captive environments, and we do so for lots of different reasons. Some of these include uh, in zoos, safari parks and sanctuaries, for sports and leisure, uh, for production, and as working animals. The second term we should probably define then is that of stereotypic behaviour, or stereotypy as it's often shortened to. Stereotypies are described as repetitive, invariant and idiosyncratic behaviours which are induced by motivational frustration, repeated attempts by an animal to cope with its environment, or by central nervous system dysfunction. Stereotypic behaviours are widely reported across captive species, and they can have significant implications for the management and welfare of these animals. For example, stereotypies may result in injury, reduce the performance of a production animal, or hamper efforts to reintroduce an animal to the wild. We generally organise stereotypic behaviours into two main categories. Oral, which are those that involve the mouth, and motor or locomotor, which involve the movement of a body part or of the whole body. In ungulates, it's oral stereotypies that we see most frequently, but whole body or locomotor behaviours do occur in some species. Um, and you can see on the slide there some examples of some of the typical stereotypies that we see in ungulates. So things like object licking, crib biting, bar biting, and then a couple of locomotor stereotypies, box walking and pacing. I guess the next question then is, what causes an ungulate to start performing stereotypic behaviours in the first place? Well, for some of the most susceptible ungulates, ungulates, potential within species risk factors for stereotypy have been identified. But as you can see on the slide here, these mainly relate to captive housing conditions and their husbandry. And actually for the majority of ungulate species, we know nothing at all 
Yeah, in the literature, we see vast interspecies differences in the type, the prevalence, and the frequency of stereotypies across captive ungulate species. But what we don't know is what drives some of these species to seem to be more susceptible than others. So in our study, we set out to fill in some of these gaps in our knowledge. We aimed to identify species level risk factors for stereotypic behaviour in ungulates by examining not just the role of captive housing and husbandry, but also whether aspects of species wild behavioural ecology were also predictive of stereotypy. Based on previous work, we hypothesised that risk factors uh, would likely fall into three key categories. So firstly, those relating to foraging, the eating and the processing of feed. Secondly, factors related to movement and the range size of animals. And lastly, factors relating to any disparities between a species natural social organisation and the social conditions they experience in captivity. To do this, we conducted two systematic literature reviews. Firstly, we searched for sources reporting data related to stereotypy performance in captive ungulate species. As well as using standard literature searching protocols, we also con contacted all Piazza accredited zoos requesting access to any unpublished data that they may have. Now, in total, this provided data for 41 species. For those 41 species, we then searched for journal articles that reported data related to their wild behavioural ecology. In both cases, sources were screened using set inclusion and exclusion criteria to ensure that high quality comparable data was used. As you can imagine, this resulted in a large data set with many missing values. In order to analyse the data, we ran a series of BRM Bayesian models, one for each of our predictor variables. We included study as a random factor, and we also accounted for phylogenetic relatedness within the models. Predictors fell into the three categories we had hypothesised to be potential drivers for stereotypy. So those related to ranging and movement. And I'll just add here that the variables that are in green are those that are associated with the wild behavioural ecology of species. And those in purple are those associated with um, captive conditions for the animals. So you can see here that our ranging and movement variables were home range size, migratory strategy, daily travel distance and time spent active in the wild, as well as enclosure size from captivity. Variables related to foraging and eating were diet diversity, feeding strategy and time spent eating in the wild, and then feed type and feeding frequency in captivity. Variables with associated with sociality were mating strategy and how similar an animal's grouping in captivity was to that it experiences in the wild. Each model used the prevalence of stereotypy in a population as the outcome variable. Now, before I show you any results, um, I just want to make you aware that because of the missing values in the data set, the sample sizes do vary between each individual model. So what did we find? We'll start by looking at ranging and movement. As you can see, enclosure size and the time an animal spent active in the wild were found to be important in predicting stereotypy. Home range size, daily travel distance and migratory strategy do not appear to play a role. So let's look at more, in more detail at the relationships between our predictors and stereotypy prevalence. But before I do, um, I just want to make it clear that the plots I'm about to show you are the conditional effects plots from the models and not plots of the original data. These give us, these provide us with a clearer visual indication of the relationships between variables, but some of the numbers on, are going to seem a little bit strange on the axes, so ju just be aware of that. 
As we might expect, smaller enclosures were associated with a higher prevalence of stereotypies. And this pattern held true even when intensively reared livestock were removed from the model. The proportion of the day that a species is active in the wild positively correlated with the prevalence of stereotypies in these animals. Now, this is really interesting. In carnivores, it was found that a larger home range size and daily travel distance were associated with, with stereotypy. But this is not the case in ungulates. Instead, it seems that activity levels are more important. Next, let's examine the results for diet and feeding related factors. As you can see, both feed type and feeding frequency in captivity play an important role in stereotypy prevalence. Of our three wild ecology variables, feeding strategy was predicted of stereotypy prevalence. However, diet diversity and the amount of time a species spends eating were not. If we look in more detail at the influence of feeding strategy, we see that species that feed entirely on browse had a higher prevalence of stereotypy in captivity than those who are able to switch between browsing and grazing in the wild. And they're referred to as a mixed strategy on the graph. Although it's not noted on the plot, there was also a trend towards browsers having a higher stereotypy prevalence than grazers as well. If we move on to our captive feeding variables, Animals fed a diet consisting entirely of concentrates had a higher prevalence of stereotypy than those fed only forage or those on a mixed diet of forage and concentrates. Now it's worth pointing out that this effect was very much driven by intensively reared pigs, as these are the species most commonly subject to a purely concentrate diet in captivity. When we look at how often we feed ungulates in captivity, animals that are fed in discrete meals showed a higher prevalence of stereotypy than those with ad lib access to feed throughout the day and night. Finally, then, let's examine the impact of social factors. So, mating strategy was found to influence stereotypy prevalence. However, whether an animal's social environment was similar to that of their wild counterparts did not play a role. When we look at a breakdown of the role of mating strategy, we see that the prevalence of stereotypy is higher in populations of promiscuous species than in those that practice polygamy or polygyny. So what does all of that mean? Well, I'd like to close by discussing some of the implications of these findings and by suggesting some ideas for what we should be doing next. This study highlights some key things that we can implement in order to reduce stereotypies in our ungulates. Firstly, we could be making enclosures bigger. And I think this is particularly important for livestock, where we usually find the most, most restrictive enclosures. We could be providing enrichment that promotes activity and increases the amount of time that our ungulates are active. And this could be a particular use in highly active species. We should be providing diets that are majority forage and only using concentrates to supplement nutritional demands where they are needed. And we should be allowing ad lib access to feed substrates throughout the day and night if we want to reduce the incidence of stereotypy in our ungulates. As our results suggest that browsing species have an increased risk of developing stereotypies, perhaps we really need to consider whether we should be keeping these species in captivity at all. And instead, perhaps we should focus on keeping just grazing and mixed feeders. This is obviously a really controversial, controversial suggestion. But if we do wish to continue housing these species, we really need to undertake research focused on how we can better meet their feeding and dietary needs in order to reduce the incidence of stereotypy in these species. Now, it appears that restrictions on mating can impact stereotypy performance, 
but more work is certainly needed in this area to understand the role that mating plays and how we can reduce the risk of developing stereotypy, particularly in promiscuous species. And on a more practical level, the results of this study can be used to aid in creating and testing, testing targeted enrichment for high-risk ungulate species in order to improve their welfare. This was very much an exploratory study, which has highlighted lots of avenues for future research. Now we know what the risk factors are, we should turn our focus to trying to understand both why and how these risk factors influence stereotypy. This will allow us to understand more about how we can prevent the development of stereotypies and ultimately improve ungulate welfare going forward. I think the real beauty of this, of this study is that it also allows us to extrapolate for species where there is little or no data and to make predictions about how well these species might be suited to captivity with regards to stereotypy development. To summarise then, we examined in this study the interspecies risk factors for stereotypic behaviour in captive ungulates. We found important risk factors for stereotypy from their captive environment, namely enclosure size, feed type and feeding frequency. We also found some important risk factors from species wild behavioural ecology, which was time spent active, feeding strategy and mating strategy. This work should allow for targeted modifications of animals' captive environments aim with the aim of reducing stereotypic behaviour in these animals. Future research should explore how and why the factors that we have highlighted here actually affect stereotypy. So I'd just like to give a huge thank you to my supervisors, Leanne, Matt and Seb, to the University of Portsmouth for funding my PhD, to Biazza and their collections that supply me with unpublished data in what has been a very difficult year for um, animal collections. And also to the lovely undergraduate placement students who helped me with screening the thousands of journal articles as part of this study, Jem, Maddie, Lilybeth and Christina. Thank you all so much for listening um, and I'm excited to answer your questions. Thank you, Kate. That was a really interesting and lovely presentation. I, I bet you acknowledge, you know, your helpers on this uh, yeah. revision of thousands of papers because I can imagine the amount of work this uh, may, may be. Um, uh, we are having quite a lot of questions. Um, some of the comments we are having are also that uh, that was that your presentation was very clear, even for uh, people who are not is not used to you know the field you are uh, talking about. Let me uh, mention or just put the the first question that comes from uh, Sarah Kappel. And um, <clears throat> so some of the species you included in your study are domesticated species while others are wild species kept in captivity. Would you expect a difference uh, between domesticated and wild species as, domestic, as domesticated species might have adopted more uh, to confinement? What's your thought? Uh, that, that was a really interesting question. Um, it wasn't something that we could particularly look into in this study. And what we really hoped was that by controlling for phylogeny and phylogenetic relatedness, we'd kind of account for that to some extent. But yeah, perhaps that perhaps we you know might expect um, domesticated species to perhaps have different different kind of coping mechanisms um, and pick more up. But I think it's really hard to unpick that because most of our highly domesticated species are also the ones that are in the highly restrictive conditions on these um, concentrate diets without ad lib access to um, forage, etc. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Uh, and, and I'll try to go, uh, you know, uh, let's let's uh, say it uh, efficient because we're having, you know, many questions and I would like to address them as much as possible. Um, the next question is from Georgia Mason. Uh, again, congratulations you on the nice talk. And uh, she um, asked about where did you get your phylogeny? 
protected risk factors for oral and whole body stereotypic behavior differ? Okay, so the phylogenetic trees I got from a website, I think it was called VertLife, Vert um, and they have kind of phylogenetic relatedness for lots and lots of different tax, uh, well, several different taxa, um, and you can go through and pick out which species you would like to create into a phylogenetic tree. So it was really useful, which actually used to then generate a thousand versions of a tree, of, the, of a tree or relatedness tree for my chosen species, um, which I then found an average tree of kind of doing some clever stuff with R. Um, so hopefully that allows for kind of variability within the trees that were generated on the website. Um, as for the differences between the motor and the oral stereotypy, that's a really good question because that's something we desperately wanted to look into, but we just didn't have enough data after all of after all those thousands of you know cert papers searched. We just didn't have enough data in either kind of camp, even with oral stereotypies and ungulates being quite common. We just didn't have the sample size to run any kind of meaningful analysis. Um, but we're hoping that you know as more research comes comes to light um and hopefully this will influence some people to do some more research um in ungulates that we maybe might be able to run those analyses further down the line great great um so next question is on uh sexual behavior or reproductive behavior that comes from paul rose and um mentioning that promiscuous species such as the giraffe are likely to be wide ranging. So do you think that covariates with some of the habitat and movement variables that you assessed? Yeah, um, very interesting. So it was very hard because of the sample sizes that we had and the missing data not all being for in the same areas for each species. We couldn't run models with with multiple variables in, um, and we would perhaps expect there maybe to be some slight relationship there. Although we did test for any correlations between variables before we ran any analyses, and the, the only one that came out of strong, we re, uh, we removed one of the predictors from our analyses. Um, yes, and I think as well with the giraffe, which is a great example, they're also a browsing species, so perhaps that also puts them at at much higher risk. Um, but yeah, that home range didn't come out as a predictor was really surprising, we, especially because working carnivores has found that exact same thing. Right, okay. I think we still have time for the, the last question. That one is a bit more methodological. Uh, there is always some space for, mm -hmm. you know, statistics and stuff, you know, is, is the question you you always are willing to to respond. Uh, uh, so, Kate, um, again, uh, in really interesting talk and analysis. Uh, but Helen Gray mentions that the coefficient for enclosure size predictor was zero. Did you rescale any of your predictor variables? And could you explain the coefficient estimation? Was it per one meter square increase, for instance? Thank you. I haven't, so we've, all, we've not long done analyses and I haven't looked into um, the exact kind of proportions um, and, and kind of the increase in risk factor as you go up the different sizes of enclosures as yet. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that was the question, but yeah, we it's something that we'll probably look at uh, um, as we run more analyses or as we unpick the data more. You want me to, to uh, repeat the, 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 the question actually, or uh, you think that's that it's enough? Yeah? Yeah, so, that's fine. <laughs> uh, you mean the, to repeat that? Oh, yes, please, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, it's on the, so the coefficient for enclosure size predictor was zero. So did you rescale any of your uh, predictor variables? Uh, I mean, all the, the other variables uh, than the enclosure size? Um, no. Um, the only thing we changed was we had to log transform 
stereotypical prevalence for I think it was feeding strategy but apart from that we kind of tried to keep them as variables. All right um, so I think we we should uh, go forward and uh, so let me first uh, acknowledge uh, Kate Levis for his for her really interesting talk and uh, also that was very informative even for for people who's not expert on um, captive animals and let's now jump to the second talk of this session that will be presented by Daniel O'Hagan uh, from uh, Newcastle University uh, from the UK and Daniel will talk about uh, the assessment of transient affective state using intracranial recording of uh, Brian oscillations in poultry. So please, let's start with the second talk. Hi, today I'll be presenting some of my findings from my thesis project, which aim to find electrophysiological markers of effective state in broiler chickens. Chicken is the second most popular meat consumed in the EU after pork. A vast amount of broiler chickens are raised and slaughtered to satisfy this demand. At the end of a broiler chicken's life cycle, it is exposed to many short-term processes prior to slaughter. Measuring the effective state of broiler chickens exposed to the pre-slaughter processes could allow us to compare and contrast different protocols. Protocols which are less negative could be implemented as standard practice. This would have a large net benefit on broiler welfare. The primary pre-slaughter processes are capture, transport, layerage and stunning. During capture, multiple broilers are restrained, inverted and carried to the transport modules. Often three birds are carried per hand to save time despite this not being the recommended procedure. Transport modules are then loaded onto lorries and the birds are transported to the processing plant. At the processing plant, the transport modules are unloaded and stacked. Birds then experience layerage where they're left in this environment to calm down prior to stunning and slaughter. During many of these conditions, broilers are often not easily accessible or are restrained, therefore many common welfare measures are difficult to implement. This project aimed to develop a new welfare measure which could be used to assess simulated pre-slaughter processes in a controlled environment. Recording activity directly from brain areas involved in emotional processing could allow us to ask broilers how they are feeling during these processes. Before the project started, we had to decide which brain areas to record from. The role of avian brain areas responsible for processing effective state is not well studied, therefore we decided to target structures which are homologous to mammalian limbic brain areas. These structures were the nucleus tenia, which is homologous to the medial amygdala, and the hippocampal formation, which is homologous to the hippocampus. Day old chicks were then procured from a hatchery and raised to six weeks old where focal birds received surgery. Firstly, we implanted focal birds with subcutaneous heart rate loggers that were attached to the pectoral muscle of the bird during a 10 minute procedure prior to the stereotaxic surgery. These loggers were pre-programmed to record heart rate during 30 minute periods which surrounded planned experimental stimuli. We then implanted four tungsten electrodes into the brain of each focal bird as each brain area was targeted in both the left and right hemisphere. Additionally, five screws were embedded into the skull of the bird in a configuration displayed in the top right figure. The four electrodes and three of the skull screws were then wired to a connector. This connector allowed the attachment of the wireless logger which stored the electrophysiological recordings for the four tungsten electrodes. The connector and skull screws were embedded into dental acrylic and surrounded with a protective plastic chamber. The head chamber could be extended with the addition of a cap during testing to accommodate the size of the logger. Following surgery, the birds were given one week to recover. After recovery, the focal bird experienced an experimental week. Each day, the focal bird was restrained and the neurologger was attached at 9am. The bird was then placed back in the focal pen and a video camera recorded footage from the focal pen throughout the day. Infrared light flashes were used to synchronise the video and electrophysiological data. The experimenter left the room after turning on the video camera and initiating synchronisation. Following this, the experimenter returned every hour to conduct one of four conditions in a semi-randomised order. These conditions were repeated in the second half of the day, therefore there was a total of eight condition presentations per experimental day. <laughs> 
The conditions were either 60 seconds of inversion where the bird was captured and held inverted by the legs, social isolation where the conspecifics were removed from the neighbouring pen for five minutes, comb pinch where the caudal tip of the comb was pinched with a surgical clamp every 10 seconds for a minute, and finally treat food where five mealworms were dispensed into a feeding bowl every 10 seconds for a minute. The bird was restrained at 6pm and the neurologger was removed. Electrophysiological data was then downloaded from the logger overnight. Heart rate data was extracted from the logger after the end of the experimental week. Firstly, I'll talk about the heart rate data. Three time points were used to portion up the heart rate data during the analysis. These time points were the baseline, experimenter and stimulus epochs. The baseline period was taken before I entered the room. The experimenter period began when I entered the room but ended before I entered the pen of the focal bird. During the experimenter epoch of inversion and pinch, the experimenter stood away from the pen. During the experimenter epoch of the treat condition, the experimenter placed a bowl containing five mealworms in front of the pen and then stood away from the pen. Finally, during the experimenter epoch of isolation, the conspecifics in the adjacent pen were captured and placed into carry boxes. The experimenter then stood away from the pen. The stimulus epoch was the first 45 seconds of each condition. The difference in heart rate from baseline values was calculated from the experimenter and stimulus epochs for each condition. These graphs show the change in heart rate from baseline during the experimenter epoch on the left and the stimulus epoch on the right. The y-axis shows change in heart rate, the x-axis shows the four conditions, asterisks above the bars denote a significant difference from zero, meaning that there was a significant change in heart rate from baseline. Shared letters between bars denote no significant difference in heart rate change between conditions. Heart rate increases during all four conditions when I enter the room. The three presumably negative conditions are not significantly different from each other, however heart rate during tree, which is presumably positive, increases significantly from baseline when I enter the room. This suggests that the experimenter entering the room and standing still before inversion and pinch is just as arousing as when the experimenter enters the room and captures the conspecifics before isolation, but that the presence of inaccessible mealworms is much more arousing than the presence of the experimenter or the collection of conspecifics. Heart rate increases dramatically from baseline during the inversion and pinch conditions, however does not change significantly from baseline during isolation. Being inverted induces a larger increase in heart rate compared to when the bird is restrained and pinched. These results suggest that inversion is more stressful than pinch and both induce more stress than isolation. It is possible that the difference in heart rate seen between inversion and pinch is due to the heart having to work harder when the bird is inverted rather than reflecting stress. Heart rate during tree is also much higher than baseline, however when comparing the two graphs it is clear that the majority of this increase happens initially when the mealworms are inaccessible, with a further more modest increase occurring when the bird can access the mealworms. I'll now move on to the electrophysiological data. So here is a figure showing where the electrophysiological data was extracted from for a typical experimental day for a single bird. The data for the first 30 seconds of each condition that occurred within the day was extracted. Data for 30 second behavioural baselines before each of these conditions was also extracted. Behavioural baselines were 30 second periods of sitting at rest, which occurred between 20 minutes before a condition and 2 minutes before a condition. These baselines were found using the video footage filmed throughout the day. Data for each of these 16 epochs was extracted from all channels, therefore from all brain areas. The data extracted from these time points were local field potentials. Local field potentials are oscillations in extracellular voltage caused by the aggregated activity of a local neuronal population. Aggregated excitatory and inhibitory activity in the local surrounding cells creates an electrical oscillation which can be recorded and analysed in multiple ways. On the right you can see the raw oscillatory recordings from each brain area of one bird during a 30 minute period. The synchronizer plot below was used to find the recordings produced during a condition, as each of the vertical lines represents when the experimenter entered and exited the pen before and after a condition was conducted. This is how the data was extracted from the condition and behavioural baseline time points.
Once the data was extracted, the change in power from the values recorded during the behavioural baseline was plotted for each of the four conditions in each brain area. The time window plotted was from five minutes before to five minutes after each stimulus occurred. The data was cleaned using a cluster filtering script to highlight time points associated with significant change in power. These graphs show filtered power in the right nucleus ternia, or TNA, during all four conditions. Frequency is on the y-axis, time is on the x-axis, and the z-axis of colour represents change in power from baseline values, with blue showing a decrease in power, yellow showing an increase in power, and green representing no significant change. Each power spectra has time points of interest denoted by the black vertical lines. During all conditions, there was a suppression of power from baseline values in some of the lower frequencies denoted by the blue pixels. During both inversion and isolation, the power suppression begins when I enter the room and ends when I leave the room a little after both conditions end. During isolation, the power suppression begins once I enter the room and stops when isolation begins once I have left the room with the conspecifics. Interestingly, this matches the previous heart rate data, which showed no significant change in heart rate from baseline during isolation, but did show an increase in heart rate when the conspecifics were being captured. Power suppression then returns once I re-enter the room with the conspecifics after isolation has ended. Finally, during treat, power suppression begins once I enter the room and then returns every five seconds whilst the bird anticipates further mealworms. This suppression ends a little after I exit the room. The suppression in power of low frequencies appears to be mostly in relation to my presence rather than what condition the bird is currently experiencing. This suggests that the power decreases from baseline could be measuring the arousal of the bird rather than the valence of the conditions. These drops in power for each condition look the same size on the power spectra, however further analyses not shown in this presentation found that they could be distinguished. We then analysed the extracted data using magnitude squared coherence. This analysis compares oscillations and scores how similar they are. On the top left we have an example 10 Hz sine wave and below that we have an oscillation composed of 10 Hz and 20 Hz sine waves. The middle plot displays the power of each oscillation. A fast Fourier transform can be used to examine the frequency domain of an oscillation rather than the time domain which is what is shown in the left hand plots. Power is a measure of how much sine waves of a specific frequency contribute to the oscillation as a whole. Higher power of a specific frequency indicates a higher contribution to the oscillation. This can be seen in both the upper and lower middle plots where the 10 Hz sine wave shows a spike in power at 10 Hz and the 10 slash 27 Hz sine waves shows a peak at those frequencies. The magnitude squared coherence plot on the right compares the two oscillations and shows that they strongly cohere at 10 Hz due to both waveforms having a 10 Hz sine wave contributing to them. Essentially coherence is a measure of how similar two signals are in the frequency domain. Additionally, extracting raw power values allowed us to examine the changes in power of specific frequency bands over time. Magnitude squared coherence was used to assess the similarity between the recorded signals of different brain areas. Change in coherence from baseline between different brain areas of the same hemisphere and the same brain areas of different hemispheres was examined during the first 30 seconds of each of the four conditions. These plots show an example of change in coherence from baseline between the left and the right TNA during the four conditions. Frequency is on the x-axis and coherence difference is on the y-axis. Inversion, isolation and pinch show similar changes in coherence from baseline, however treats shows a much larger increase in coherence from baseline, particularly in the low frequencies below 10 Hz. We extracted data from the theta and alpha bands for all brain area comparisons and all conditions. Theta is between 4 and 8 Hz and alpha is between 8 and 12 Hz. This frequency range was selected as it's commonly used in the rodent literature. Only data from the alpha bands will be presented from now on though. These plots compare the change in alpha coherence from baseline between the brain areas across the four conditions. Change in coherence is on the y-axis and the conditions are on the x-axis, with each bar representing mean change in coherence in the alpha band between the two brain areas during a specific condition. The top left plot shows coherence between the right HF and the right TNA. The top right plot shows coherence between the left HF and left TNA. 
bottom left plot shows coherence between the right HF and the left HF. And finally, the bottom right plot shows coherence between the right TNA and the left TNA. Multiple linear mixed models were used to compare the differences between conditions. Asterisks above bars indicate a significant difference from zero, meaning that there was a significant change in coherence from baseline. Brackets between bars indicate a significant difference between conditions. These graphs show that there is a significant increase in alpha coherence between the right and left HF, the right and left TNA, and the left HF and the left TNA during treat, but not during the other three conditions. This could be a potential marker of positive valence, however further work is required to examine if this is feeding specific or applies to other positively valenced experiences. With that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. I'd also like to thank my supervisor, Tom Smolders, and I would like to thank you for, for the opportunity to speak and deliver this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, Daniel. Uh, that was indeed an interesting and uh, also uh, intensive talk, uh, lots of information on neurophysiology and the uh, relationship uh, with animal welfare. Um, I'm looking for questions from the audience, which may be coming. Um, I have a, a question that there was a willing that could be uh, somehow uh, resolved at the end of your talk, but I, you know, that was difficult for me. So uh, at the end, uh, what are the the implications uh, in terms of uh, using the methodology you suggest um, in order to assess whether birds, you know, are um, handled uh, currently, for instance, uh, and and to assess the level of animal welfare. So about the implications, I would I would like to hear. Thank uh, you. Yeah, of course. Um, so. The, the aim was to find brain markers, um, brain activity markers of affective state, because um, we thought that would be the easiest to assess um, whether an animal is having a good experience or a bad experience. So we thought uh, measuring directly from the brain at the source of emotion um, would be the best place to look. Uh, so yeah, uh, we found uh, the alpha coherence um, between the hippocampus and the nucleus ternier, um, which are both regions which are known in mammals to be um, uh, involved in emotional processing. Um, so that was that was why we chose them. And uh, if we use them uh, further in future studies um, in industrially relevant experiences so in simulated transport or simulated handling um i don't think these could be used in field because of the the delicate nature of the the implant itself um but if we used it in simulated processes it could show whether the animal is having a good or bad experience even when it's restrained so usually you'd use something like behavior or cortisol um to assess stress but this could use um methods which which are better when the animal is restrained or not easily accessible because um, you can do it remotely uh, so you could do it for long transport trips um, and you could do it for layerage as well um, i feel from my research um, it's still questionable whether layerage is actually beneficial for the animals or not um, so that could be producing further stress if the animals are sat there uh, in the warehouse um, so, so that was one of them, and the other one was heart rate. We were using a, a commonly used measure of affective state, well, arousal, um, in heart rate, and we did find a link between heart rate and the brain data, the coherence, uh, the power, sorry. Um, so in my graphs, uh, power decreased from baseline um, when I entered the room, which is presumably stressful for the animals, um, and heart rate increased, and there was um, an association between that. So as heart rate increased, um, power decreased. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and now uh, we are receiving more and more questions from the audience. Uh, let me mention the first one. Uh, that's from Hugh Gollich uh, over the chat. Do you think this method may be able to detect more long-lasting 
effective states due to, for instance, uh, housing conditions if you record chronically? Um, potentially. Um, so, so the aim was was to be um, immediate to assess immediate um, transient effective state. Um, so, fit short term processes like pre slaughter processes, but possibly measuring chronically could, uh, yeah, could could look at um, yeah environmental issues uh, such as different types of bedding or yeah, I, I could imagine um, some results coming from that. Um, I'm not sure how you'd differentiate it. I suppose you'd, you'd look at the power differences and see if they get worse or better over time. Um, certainly we did look at some um, some of the conditions uh, in terms of, uh, sorry, uh, what do you call it? Repeat, repeat states. We were looking at repeats. We were looking at sensitization is what we were looking for um, for, the, for the conditions. Um, uh, so we did see a, a little bit of that desensitization mainly um, in this in the, in those results in the brain data over time. Excellent. Okay, uh, going for more questions. So still, you will see that people is interested on how this can be used in in applied animal welfare science. And for instance, there is a question from Sophia Heppel uh, asking, "What do you think the results tell you about isolating chickens?" Um, yeah, so the results for isolation were, were surprising, to be honest, because isolation um, of chickens is, is supposed to be stressful. Uh, certainly they do behavioral uh, stress, uh, so they, they do contact calls, well, alarm, alarm calls. Um, and, and I did witness that um, anecdotally in, in a lot of the chickens. Um, but I think, so our project was split into two studies. The first study, uh, we looked at, we were looking at farm reared broilers. So we got them at five, four weeks old from, from broiler farms. And I feel like they were more susceptible to isolation than um, ours were that were raised in house. But that's just anecdotally. We haven't actually analyzed that yet. Um, certainly, I feel like they did more contact calls, which would, you know, it would be thought that that would be more stressful for them if they were doing more contact calls. Um, I'd like to look into it further. Um, certainly, there was, there was a, a difference between the first and last 30 seconds of the five minute isolation. Um, and we're currently doing behavioral work to try and link more behavior. And so those contact calls with the brain data. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see what comes out of that. Okay, and, and time for the, the last question. Um, uh, uh, Michelle Reeves is congratulating you on this interesting talk. Um, and he's asking actually, which step in catching transport was the pinch condition meant to imitate? Or was it used as a general negative experience? Yeah, so that wasn't an industrially relevant experience. Um, you know, they don't often get pinched, but it was to try and tease apart pain and the inversion of restraint. Um, so, you know, when the birds get inverted, when they are carried to the to the boxes, um, there could be some joint pain. There's certainly joint stress going on there, um, being inverted by the legs. Um, so the pinch condition was to try and have a pain stimulus. Now, it did have a restraint element to it but it wasn't inverted, so the birds weren't tipped upside down. So it was kind of to tease apart both restraint by being held to the floor and inverted restraint, which could be worse, um, and it looked worse, um, and, and just pain as well. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dan, for, for all this uh, huge uh, piece of knowledge on the new methodology that will be uh, coming to assess animal welfare in the, in the present you're doing, but uh, for sure in the future. And uh, now perhaps is the, the time to jump to the next uh, talk uh, that will be presented by Andrea Polanco, uh, coming from Canada, University of Guelph. And Andrea will present a work uh, again on, on captive animals and uh, with the title, what can abnormal behavior teach us about captive animals' quality of life? Validating stereotypic behavior as a cumulative welfare indicator in laboratory rhesus monkeys, macaca mulata.
please the next video and looking forward to it. Today, I'll be discussing some of my PhD research that looks at whether abnormal behaviors can be used as indicators of lifetime welfare in laboratory rhesus monkeys. Despite monkeys representing only 0.2% of all research animals worldwide, so approximately 160,000 monkeys, they are commonly used in vaccine research. The reliance on monkeys for vaccine research has resulted in a shortage of these animals within the last year, as depicted in this New York Times article from February of this year. The welfare of laboratory monkeys will no doubt undergo more scrutiny during this time given that animal research is controversial, containing polarized opinions, and especially since the topic of vaccine testing in animals is being highlighted in major news outlets. This all means that there is great value to measuring and improving laboratory monkey welfare. One research gap in assessing laboratory monkey welfare is not understanding what the effects are of repeated aversive and rewarding life events on their welfare, also known as lifetime welfare. Regulatory bodies often now call for lifetime or cumulative welfare to be evaluated, thereby igniting scientists to study this topic, as seen in this UK committee. In humans, we know that the number of stressful life events predicts reduced life satisfaction and increased depression, so it's worth considering how cumulative stress affects other animals too. This is crucial for laboratory monkeys since they are typically reused in different studies and are thus exposed to repeated stressors such as location moves, blood draws, and separations from cage mates. The biggest benefit of having an objective lifetime welfare indicator would be that it could act as a humane endpoint, so it would signpost when, after experiencing X number of events, a monkey's welfare has taken a detrimental toll such that they should be removed from research. Simply taking the crude count of life events to make this decision is not very helpful as it doesn't give us a threshold because we don't know how many negative events are too detrimental, nor do we know how many positive events are needed to offset the consequences of repeated stressors. And furthermore, monkeys likely vary in their resilience. So instead what is needed is an indicator that capture animals' responses to life events. There are clues from the literature that suggest that abnormal behaviors may be worth investigating as potential lifetime welfare indicators. Abnormal behaviors are behaviors known or hypothesized to result from underlying distress or pathology. So these include stereotypic behaviors, which are repetitive movements like pacing or hair plucking as seen in these videos, and hunch postures, which is sitting immobile with the head at the same level or lower than the shoulders, and the image is an example of a macaque displaying a hunch posture. And there is evidence, some evidence that stereotypic behaviors and hunch postures could be valid indicators of lifetime welfare in laboratory monkeys. For example, rewarding experiences predict fewer stereotypic behaviors, including being mother-eared, especially outdoors, and years spent outdoors. While repeated aversive experiences, including the number of location moves, number of research projects, and years spent single, predict more stereotypic behaviors and hunch postures. And hunch postures are also associated with pain and illness. The current study tested the hypothesis that stereotypic behaviors and hunch postures are valid lifetime welfare indicators. This hypothesis makes two predictions. First, a lifetime stress score should show a positive association with these behaviors. And second, Model fit should improve when all welfare relevant life events are added together compared to a model only accounting for demographics neutral to welfare, such as age, sex, and facility. For this study, I observe, observed 247 indoor housed rhesus macaques from two US primate facilities with similar numbers at each facility. 35% of the sample was single housed, 56% of the sample was female with a mean age of 9.67 years ranging from one to almost 30 years of age. Animals were selected opportunistically based on project status and weekly room availability. Behavioral observations were live recorded from video cameras that were stationed in front of two adjacent cages at a time. I accessed live video feed outside the room. 
I was blind to prior life experiences, but it was not possible for me to be blind to current cage dynamics, such as whether the monkey was single or paired housed, top or bottom rack caged, and a distance from the door. I observed five rooms at each facility, and after one day of camera habituation, behavioral data were collected for four or five consecutive days per room at each facility. All subjects were observed across two observational periods, approximately two hours before and approximately two hours after afternoon feeding. Scanning took place approximately every five minutes during each observational period, and I used focal sampling for abnormal behaviors. Our ecogram was based on previous work validating subcategories of co-occurring behaviors since previously published subcategories were formed of heterogeneous behaviors, that is, behaviors that weren't actually co-occurring. Our new valid subcategories, now made up of behaviors that co-occur, included a subcategory of rocking, swinging, bouncing, and twirling, repeated at least three times, a subcategory of pacing and head twisting, repeated at least three times, and hair plucking and hunch postures were categorized alone, since they were not found to co-occur with any other behavior tested. And hunch postures also had to meet a duration criterion of 30 seconds following an ecogram of a previous study. Moving on to life events, the ones chosen for the study were pre-established to be good or bad for welfare by using a validation criterion commonly used in our lab. Briefly, I looked at the literature and saw how these events affect welfare in humans, as well as whether they're preferred or non-preferred experiences in non-human primates, and if they would promote or reduce their fitness in the wild. Positive life events were delayed mother-infant separation, being outdoor reared with a mother, spending time outdoors, and being paired housed if indoors. Negative life events included early mother-infant separation, being reared indoors, and experiencing location changes, illnesses, and injuries. I should also, should also note here that for currently paired housed animals, there were times when the grate between the two cages were closed to keep animals apart. Therefore, current social status was calculated as a proportion of observation single. Life event records were extracted from each center's digital management system. After obtaining the raw data, variables of interest were generated by running queries to obtain either a count or a duration from date of birth until the first day of behavioral data collection. Here, I also made sure to obtain medical records for each hunch monkey's week of behavioral data collection, such as data on medications, illnesses, or injuries, to ensure that their hunch postures were not due to current illness or pain. Following human literature, we created a composite score of lifetime stress that was the sum of life events, but after standardizing each event. Each event was standardized between 0 to 1, 1 being most aversive and 0 being least aversive. So rewarding events were either reverse scored or given the lowest score, if categorical, to hold the lowest value. Continuous variables were standardized by dividing them by their maximum value. For categorical variables like rearing and maternal separation age, each level was given a score between 0 to 1. After standardizing each life event, they were summed to create an overall lifetime stress score, where a higher value indicates more lifetime stress. One limitation of the score is that it assumes that each life event carries the same weight in affecting welfare, and it's highly likely that life events differ in severity. So this score is not perfect, but it was practical. For the overall lifetime stress score, the maximum score could have been 13, but the medium in my sample was close to 4 and the interquartile range was 3.15 to 4.95. To test prediction number one, a mixed logistic model was run with the outcome being the abnormal behavior in binomial format, presence or absence, in each scan, such that the model is predicting the odds of the abnormal behavior being detected in a scan. We chose to do this versus linear models because time budgets of abnormal behaviors are unlikely to meet model assumptions and unlikely to meet uh, or achieve transformations. Separate models were run for each abnormal behavior subcategory. Predictor variables included the composite lifetime stress score, facility, and the interactions between score and facility and score and sex. I also controlled for facility, sex, and age. Random effects were animal ID, nested in cage, and nested in room. To test the second prediction, I used Ikeiki information criterion to assess model fit, where a smaller value means a better model fit. I compared AIC to the model with demographics neutral to welfare to the AIC of the model with these variables plus all 13 welfare relevant events.
Moving on to the results. Overall, self-directed hair plucking was the most prevalent abnormal behavior in the sample, shown in approximately 44% of monkeys, followed by hunched postures, which were seen in 32% of monkeys. The other abnormal behaviors were less prevalent, including pacing, only seen in 19% of monkeys, and then the rocking stereotypic behaviors, seen in less than 10% of the monkeys sampled. So does the lifetime stress score predict abnormal behaviors? Uh, yes, for most, so a unit increase in lifetime stress score significantly increased the odds of hair plucking by 1.7 to 1, the odds of pacing by 2.55, and the odds of the rocking subcategory by 3.78. And again, this was controlling for age, sex, and facility. This means that more lifetime stress is correlated with higher odds of seeing these behaviors. However, this was not the case for hunched postures. There was no significant association with the score of lifetime stress. As for prediction number two, does model fit improve when adding all life events to the model with just demographic variables? Yes, for hair plucking and hunch postures. So AIC decreases when adding all life events to the model. However, this was not the case for pacing in the rocking stereotypic behavior subcategory. Here, AIC increased after adding all life events to the model, which means that the sum of life events is not a good fit for predicting the odds of pacing and the rocking subcategory. In summary, while some behaviors met one of two predictions, only hair plucking met both predictions, thereby indicating that it is the best candidate for a lifetime welfare indicator. I further investigated the direction of associations between welfare relevant events and the odds of hair plucking from the model test in prediction number two to make sure that individual life events were predicting hair plucking in the expected direction, that is, aversive events increasing its odds and rewarding events reducing its odds. Looking at the highlighted cases, I found that most negative life events reduced rather than increased the odds of hair plucking, although these were not statistically significant. So these include number of hair separations, number of location moves, and number of projects. Since these directions were not what was expected, I used an objective method to assess how predictive and influential these life events were, as it was possible that they're just trivial relationships that don't really influence hair plucking. This was done by finding the best fitting model through a hierarchical model selection process that started with a base model of age, sex, and facility. This base model was compared to additional models that included a single welfare relevant life event as a predictor variable, and each life event was added in an order based on the size of their odds ratio. If the additional life event improved model fit, then it was kept in the model until all life events were assessed for inclusion, thereby resulting in the best fitting model. And the final best fitting model for hair plucking actually revealed that most of these relationships were not very influential as they were not included. Instead, the best fitting model comprised only three welfare relevant life events while controlling for sex, age, and facility. These were maternal separation age, years spent indoors, and current proportion of observations spent single. Specifically, time spent indoor housed across one's lifetime increased the odds of hair plucking, but this was not significant, while current time spent single housed significantly increased the odds of hair plucking. Furthermore, there were significantly higher odds of hair plucking in monkeys separated from the dam between 12 to under 24 months of age compared to those separated at 24 months of age or later and those separated under six months of age also showed higher odds, although this was not significant. In contrast, those separated between six to under 12 months of age showed lower odds of hair plucking than those separated at 24 months of age or greater, but this was not significant and it's likely a type one error since there's no biological basis for it. In conclusion, pacing, rocking stereotypic behaviors, and hunched postures are not lifetime welfare indicators as they were not predicted by the lifetime stress score and or they were not best predicted by all life events together in the model. However, while they don't co-vary with every good and bad event in a monkey's life, they are still useful indicators of specific forms of poor welfare as found in many other studies and therefore should not be ignored if observed. On the other hand, I found that self-directed hair plucking seen in 45% of my sample was both positively predicted by the lifetime stress score and it was better predicted by all life events together, therefore indicating that's a lifetime welfare indicator. And this was true across both sexes and facilities, 
and it's also analogous to trichotillomania, hair pulling disorder in humans which is also positively associated with the number of traumatic life events, including early childhood trauma. Hair plucking can therefore serve as a humane endpoint for laboratory macaques worldwide. And in my sample, for example, it suggests that the 45% who displayed it should be retired from research. Although extra validation studies are needed to understand why some negative life events reduced its odds, and to understand if the monkeys who do, don't show hair plucking yet experience the same stressors are truly resilient or express the accumulation of stress differently. Such studies will confirm that hair plucking is a lifetime welfare indicator or if it's instead prone to missing cases of stressed animals. The latter would suggest that hair plucking may be an iceberg welfare indicator instead, where it reflects many but not all poor welfare conditions and thus considered a more conservative humane endpoint. Oh, this, this would still be extremely useful, especially in conjunction with other humane endpoints or indicators. Thank you for watching my presentation, and I'd also like to thank the monkeys, the primate centers, the primate technicians, my collaborators, funders, and advisory committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this very interesting talk indeed. And uh, while we are receiving questions, uh, I would like to take advantage of my position and, and address you the first uh, question, which is very applied. Do you think that um, video analysis, and I mean uh, uh, using artificial intelligence, could be useful uh, when assessing this kind of behavior? Uh, I mean, to assess it uh, automatically and systematically uh, if that ever turns out to be an, uh, a human endpoint, for instance, in, in research uh, with uh, macacos? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question and suggestion. I can see that working for more motor-like abnormal behaviors that where there's a lot of movement involved. I don't know how um, sensitive AI would be to specific types of types of behaviors or something like hair plucking where it involves really smaller levels of movement because it's just like pluck, pluck, pluck sometimes with the hand or in the video that I showed earlier, um, the monkey was using their teeth to hair pluck. So if the AI can be trained to sensitively pick up on those small movements, then absolutely that would be a great way for large um, laboratory facilities where there's about, yeah, hundreds and hundreds of indoor housed monkeys and that would be very useful for them to use. Okay, um, I'm now taking questions from, from attendance and the first from Jean-Luc Raoul, uh, who's uh, asking uh, whether you suggest higher plucking as an endpoint, but do the monkeys recover even if retired, not submitted to experiments anymore? Or is it like stereotypes as a behavior scar that may remain? Yeah, that's a, another great question. Um, and it does bring up those ethical dilemmas of suggesting hair plucking as a humane endpoint, because even let's say you send them to a sanctuary and that's your goal of using a humane endpoint, but they still show hair plucking in that sanctuary. So what, like, what do you do in that situation? Um, and it's, I don't know if they actually recover. So once you send them to a sanctuary where you hope that their welfare work will improve. I don't know. We don't have studies that have tracked hair plucking longitudinally over time to see whether, or even with enrichment manipulations to know enough about the recovery of hair plucking itself. I would love if someone wants to do that type of research in terms of treatment and management. So this study really brings out future hypotheses to test in terms of treatment and management. And right now we just don't have that information. Okay, uh, I guess it's room for further discussion in the future about the, the field. Uh, another question from Brianna Gaskill, uh, fantastic presentation, so uh, congratulations. Did you consider including um, whether rooms, facilities were using positive reinforcement training? I would, or she would imagine that this might add to the positive experience or at least neutralize the negative ones. 
Yeah, that's a great, I keep saying that. <laughs> Thank you, Brianna. Um, no, I actually don't know if certain rooms had more positive reinforcement training than others. And there might be a way for me to retrospectively obtain that type of data and see if that had a neutralizing effect on the stressors, as you eloquently put. But yeah, that would be that would be great to know because it would also kind of tie into that last question of whether, again, getting at that treatment and management of hair plucking. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another question from Tom Smulders. Uh, he wonders whether uh, he saw it correctly. Is the effect on winning between 12 and 24 months consistent with David Messi's result on alopecia? Sorry, can you, can you repeat that? Sure. Is the effect on winning between 12 and 24 months consistent with David Macy, uh, Massey results on alopecia? Oh, so the weaning, yeah, 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 okay. I actually haven't checked out alopecia work, but I know that hair plucking is one risk factor for alopecia, but alopecia is so multifactorial, like it can be due to many different things. I actually didn't know that early weaning was associated with alopecia as well. Um, probably not. What was the second part of that question? Sorry. <laughs> the second question whether uh, was whether this was consistent uh, with uh, uh, the Messi's result on, on alopecia uh, with that winning between 12 and, and 24 months. I think uh, Tom is asking whether uh, he, he catched that uh, correctly and whether there was this uh, effect consistent uh, with uh, David, but um, you know, uh, perhaps we can, you can catch up later about this. Yeah, yeah, no, I would have to check out those studies. Thank you, Tom, for bringing that up. Okay, um, and uh, more uh, questions. We may have uh, time for a last uh, question before we go to the uh, to the next. And that comes from uh, Megan Lafollet. Uh, so interesting. Thank you. Do you think the results would have been any different if you had only scored pair or group housed monkeys? Absolutely. Um, so anecdotally, um, primate technicians that I've talked to haven't actually observed hair plucking in the outdoor housed groups. And what you see in group housing tends to be partner plucking versus self-directed hair plucking. And there have been studies in, done in captive um, bonobos that actually have compared self-directed hair plucking to partner plucking in these grouped housed um, bonobos. And they found that they're actually distinctly different. So only self-directed hair plucking tends to be uh, relevant for welfare where they found that partner plucking actually wasn't associated with any of the welfare variables that they had. So yeah, absolutely. I think um, self-directed hair plucking is specific to, well, just be, yes, based on other studies, I would say it's specific to single housing, whereas the partner-directed hair plucking, it would be specific to group housing, but that latter shown in those other studies tends, tends to not be relevant for welfare. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrea. I'm, I'm afraid we, we uh, you know, run off of time, uh, and uh, we should now go for the the last uh, presentation for this session, which comes from Eileen McLillan, uh, from also from Canada and also from the University of Gales, Gales, excuse me. Uh, Eileen will present uh, um, a work uh, on uh, judgment bias. So, is the glass half full? Validation and application of a novel judgment bias task for mice. So please, uh, the last. Hi everyone, I'm Aileen and today I'm going to be talking about validating a novel judgment bias task for mice and its application in biomedical research. As you all know, judgment bias is a type of cognitive bias and cognitive biases are differences in the ways that people in positive or negative emotional states process information. <laughs> 
In humans, judgment bias is assessed through unconditional responses to ambiguous stimuli, and it refers to the way that people in negative states interpret ambiguous stimuli as negative, while those in positive states tend to interpret them as positive. So for example, someone with anxiety might interpret the facial expression in the center of the scale below as negative, while someone in a happy state might see the same face as positive. It's likely that these biases have an adaptive value and are therefore conserved across species. Judgment biases are often described in terms of optimism and pessimism, which is useful in animal research because they can be operationalized. So optimism here would be increased expectation of reward in response to ambiguity, while pessimism would be expecta increased expectation of punishment. The first group to successfully uh, develop a judgment bias test for animals was Harding and colleagues, and they trained mice that one auditory cue predicted a reward, another cue predicted punishment, and then they presented them with intermediate, ambiguous cues, and they showed that rats who had experienced chronic, unpredictable stressors interpreted those tones pessimistically, responding as though they expected punishment. So since this groundbreaking work, um, judgment bias tests have been developed for a wide range of species, from dogs to bees, and they have the potential to be a really powerful tool for assessing animal affect and welfare. But as exciting and valuable as these tasks are, new judgment bias tasks should always be carefully validated. And this is because animal judgment bias tasks are quite different from the human tasks that inspired them. So they involve discrimination learning, performance of operant responses for food, and sometimes they produce null or counter counterintuitive results in animals. So what does it take to properly validate a judgment bias task as sensitive to effective state? Well, first, when I say validation, I mean construct validation. So does the task measure what it claims to be measuring? To do this, we need to start with research subjects that have had their effective states manipulated in well understood ways. So evidence for this could come from changes in other reliable indicators of affect or support from the literature showing that preferred or aversive treatments have been applied. Then for the task itself, we first need to demonstrate that animals can discriminate between the positive and negative cues presented Basically, can they meet learning criteria? And then we need to confirm that animals are able, are interpreting the intermediate cues we present as ambiguous. Only if these three assumptions are met, can we investigate whether effective state influences responses to ambiguity. So here, a task is valid if we can show that effective state impacts these responses in predicted directions. So negative affect would predict pessimism and or positive affect would be predicting optimism. For laboratory mice, though, validating a judgment bias task has proven to be quite challenging. So of the 16 published experiments, 11 have attempted construct validation and failed, and by this I mean they attempted to meet the criteria from the previous slide, but, not, but did not meet one or more. And then five of these 16 didn't attempt validation, so these groups showed that they had a task that could be discriminated and the ambiguous cues were, in, were treated as intermediate, but they didn't show evidence that known differences in affect altered responses to ambiguity, which is crucial. So although judgment bias tasks are clearly very challenging to develop for laboratory mice, this is exactly what we aimed to do. Our subjects were 36 female mice from two widely used strains, C57BL6 and Valve-C. And to manipulate their effective states, they are randomly assigned to enriched cages like the one on the top here, and conventional shoebox cages like the one on the bottom. Enriched cages are highly preferred, and in fact, mice will push heavy weights to access them, and they reliably improve welfare, whereas conventional cages are restrictive and they reliably reduce welfare. We used a scent-based go-go digging task, and go-go tasks mean that mice have to make an active choice during the task, so choosing between one action and another, and these have been shown to be more sensitive to affect than go no go judgment bias tasks where animals have to decide between acting and refraining from a response. Um, we used odor cues as our discriminative stimuli since mice have excellent olfactory abilities and the task required mice to dig for buried treats since they are naturally mice motivated to, dig to do for so buried in treat. foraging or brewing. The apparatus was a rectangular arena containing a start compartment and two long arms with digging pots at each end. Um, and the odor cues were presented at the beginning of each arm on cotton pads and at the end of the arm on the bed on the bedding of the pots themselves. As discriminative stimuli, we used diluted mint and vanilla essences. So half of the mice were assigned to have mint as their positive discriminative stimulus, half were assigned to vanilla, and this was counterbalanced across housing and stream. And when ambiguous cues were eventually presented, um, these were 50-50 mixtures of those mint and vanilla odors. 
In each trial, one arm of the apparatus was always unscented and the other arm was always scented, so marked with either the positive or negative discriminative stimulus. Mice had to learn that in the scented arm, one odor cue would predict a high value braid reward, so their positive discriminative stimulus, or cue, and while the other odor would predict the absence of a reward, so their negative discriminative stimulus, or negative cue. The only essence, only one essence would be presented in each arm for trial, so always choosing between a scented and an unscented arm, and in the unscented arm, um, rodent chow, their regular diet, was always present as a low value reward, and this arm was marked with distilled water as a cue. In the first five weeks leading uh, of differential housing, we ran pilot tests to identify high and low value reward. So here, dried sweetened banana chips and rodent chow, being their regular diet, were used. Digging pots were also placed in home cages with treats as pre-digging training, and after this phase, we moved on to training within the apparatus. So digging training lasted five days, including um, just positive trials, so two per day. And here the treat was progressively buried throughout. So by the end of this phase, I should have learned to dig for buried treats. The next phase was discrimination training where negative trials were introduced. So this phase lasted 10 days. Mice experienced two, two trials per day, uh, sorry, two positive and two negative trials per day. And just to hopefully hammer this home, in positive trials, mice were choosing between the arm marked with their positive discriminative stimulus, which would indicate a buried high value reward and an unscented arm containing a buried low value reward. And then in negative trials, they were choosing between the arm marked with their negative discriminative stimulus, which indicated no reward was present and an unscented arm containing a low value reward. And finally, we were able, able to move on to the testing phase and assess whether mice learned the task and demonstrated judgment bias. So this phase lasted three to five days, depending on how long it took mice to meet learning criteria. These test trials were unrewarded, so no buried treats, and they alternated positive and negative trials across days. They lasted two minutes, were video recorded, and these were scored by observers blind to treatment. To meet learning criteria, mice had to dig for twice as long in the scented arm of the positive trial as they did in the negative trial on consecutive days, and mice who did discriminate the task were then presented with an ambiguous odor mixture the following day, and their latency and digging duration was scored. Responses in the first one and two minutes of testing were analyzed using repeated measured mixed models, and I'll be presenting one minute data here for simplicity, but all effects were consistent across the two minute trials as well. So, we've already, so first we did already have evidence that effective state had been manipulated partially from support from the literature because this housing system has been used in previous experiments, but also um, we confirmed this with we confirmed expected behavioral changes through home cage observations. So assumption number one is taken care of, but how well is our task meeting these basic technical criteria? So 31 of 35 mice met learning criteria, and you can see that we appear to have the expected graded responses for both latency at the top and digging time at the bottom. However, there was a trial by scent interaction, um, but when split by scent, we still have the expected differences between positive and negative trials for both scents. So um, in the positive trial, mice showing the shortest latencies, longest and negative, and in for digging time, they had the longest digging duration in positive trials, shortest and negative. So our mice were effectively discriminating between positive and negative cues, which meant we could move on to our next assumption, confirming that our ambiguous cues were appropriate. So the trial by scent interaction from the previous assumption also revealed that mint and vanilla mice were interpreting their ambiguous mixture differently. So in the graphs below, you can see latency on the left and digging time on the right. And for mice with vanilla as their positive cue, we have the expected greater response for both latency and for digging time. Um, however, for mice with mint as their positive discriminative stimulus, you can see that they are treating the ambiguous cue, the ambiguous odor mixture as positive for both latency and for digging time. So therefore, they're not interpreting that ambiguous cue as intermediate. Um, and so this means that our assumption three was met, but only for mice that had vanilla as their positive discriminative stimulus. So finally, for these mice, we could investigate whether their effective states were impacting their responses to ambiguity. What we found was that the housing effects on latency were significant in the ambiguous trial. So you can see the shorter latencies in enriched animals here. Um, and the effect size here was large, and there were no significant housing effects in positive and negative trials, which is what we want to see, so it's good news. For digging time, on the other hand, there was no significant housing effect. 
So, when assessing latency in mice that had vanilla as their positive cue, our fourth and final assumption was met, which meant that we had validated the first ever judge and bias task for mice. In experiment two, we applied our task to mice with tumors to a test for low moods that are common in human patients. So subjects here were 20 male and 19 female nude mice, and they were randomly assigned to control or tumor bearing treatments. So the tumors themselves were subcutaneous lung adenocarcinoma tissues, widely used in oncology and associated with inflammatory cytokines that tend to precipitate negative mood in human cancer patients. And the reason we were so interested in these mice is because most welfare guidelines for oncology research currently do not focus on psychological changes, so mainly severe pain and discomfort, and we were worried that that might be insensitive or missing some states of suffering, and we wanted to see whether our judgment bias task detected signs of poor welfare that arise before other clinical signs. We use the same scent-based go-go digging task as experiment one, but because these tasks are very labor-intensive, we used only the shortened one-minute protocol that we had validated. Vanilla was used as our positive discriminative stimulus for all mice because only this odor worked in experiment one, and our high and low value rewards here were almonds and cornflakes, respectively, based on pilot tests with this strain. Again, mice underwent digging and discrimination training prior to being tested in unrewarded positive and negative trials, and those that met learning criteria were tested for judgment bias. So 12 females and 17 males met learning criteria, and they were tested in ambiguous trials. And we had a significant trial by treatment by sex interaction. So for females, um, both, both treatments interpreted the ambiguous cue as negative, which you can see here. But for males, we did have the expected graded response. And when we look at the treatment effects for males, we can see that tumor bearing animals had significantly longer latencies in the ambiguous trial, indicative, uh, indicative of pessimism and low mood, and raising concerns for their welfare. Unexpectedly, though, tumor-bearing animals also showed shorter latencies in the negative trial. So what does all of this mean taken together? So um, experiment one, to our knowledge, is the first evidence of a successful construct validation of a mouse judgment bias task, which we're pretty excited about and has potential to be a really valuable tool in mouse welfare assessment. We think this task might have been successful due to the large treatment effects on housing conditions, uh, the ethological task design, the sensitive go-go method, and luck, if we had only chosen mint as our positive discriminative stimulus, the task would have failed. In experiment two, um, the, to our knowledge, this is the first evidence of pessimism in tumor-bearing animals, and these results confirmed our task's potential. So males implanted with tumors showed pessimism at, indicative of low mood, and these findings suggest that although more subtle psychological changes are not often the focus of oncology welfare guidelines, they should be given consideration, and it also highlights the importance of thoroughly assessing the impact of these disease manipulations on mouse welfare. However, for this experiment, it also highlighted the need for further validation and refinement. So the degree of pessimism was surprising, ambiguous cues being treated more negatively than negative ones, and it's currently unclear whether this reflects neophobia to the scent mixture, a type 1 error, or another effect. It's also unclear why females showed no tumor-induced judgment bias, and this is perhaps reflective of floor effects, since even control females treated the ambiguous cue as negative, um, maybe because both treatment groups were conventionally housed in this case. So the sensitivity of this promising new task does need to be improved. Um, and we suggest that future work uh, involve pilot tests to confirm which odor mixtures will be interpreted as ambiguous, um, as well as the use of multiple ambiguous probes, so near positive and negative cues. And such replication and refinement is important since this humane task opens the door to test important hypotheses across diverse fields of research, which is something with animal welfare and clinical implications. Um, so if you're interested in more details on this um, experiment and this task, please see our recent paper in Physiology and Behavior. And with that, I'd like to say thank you so much to UFA for organizing this event, to the Mason Lab, our fantastic animal care staff, our funders, and of course our mice. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them in the live Q&A. Thank you, Eileen, for this interesting talk. And now is the time for the live Q&A. So uh, while the questions are coming, which we already have a few,
Uh, I will I will start with the first. I cannot uh, stay without uh, asking this. Um, do you think, or uh, why is uh, what do you think there was no judgment bias detected in in uh, females during the second experiment? How do you reckon this? Yeah, great question. So. Um... That effect on females where they were interpreting the ambiguous cue as negative from both the tumor bearing and control treatments, it could potentially be a true sex difference in the way they're interpreting those olfactory cues. We don't really have reason to believe that, but it's, it's quite possible. Um, it also could be an, a floor effect because females from both treatments were kept in standard housing conditions, like used in experiment one, and potentially. This means that both treatment groups are showing negative judgment biases, and then we weren't getting that intermediate response that you would expect. So something to look, uh, I guess, investigate further in the future would be using enriched housing treatments and retesting these animal models with those standards. Okay, and uh, now going for the first question, uh, this is from Lindsay Robbins. Um, um, she wonder whether uh, uh, you had heard anything about mice not liking the smell of mine pepper mine, which might explain uh, the scent difference scene. Um, I haven't read that that is aversive to them. However, I think if it was, we would have seen the mice assigned with mint as their positive cue. We would have seen longer latencies and probably shorting, shorter degenerations, even in the positive and negative trials. And we weren't seeing that. We were only getting that odd effect in the ambiguous trial. And we think what happened here, so this is just anecdotal, but when we were mixing the, the odors for the ambiguous cues, even just to our human experimenters, the 50-50 mixture did smell a little bit more minty. Um, so we think it might just have been a bit more overpowering and those animals were essentially interpreting it as their positive cue. All right. Um, now is on the, the consequences of the, uh, the differences in judgment bias. And Brianna asks on uh, whether you look at how judgment bias correlated with tumor size. Do they become more pessimistic with tumor size? Uh, we didn't detect differences, or there wasn't an effective tumor volume, so we did in include that. Um, I, I will say, though, I don't think we had a ton of variation in tumor volume, so potentially that could be something, a new research question in the future, testing mice at different points of growth and development, but in this particular experiment, tumor volume uh, wasn't impactful. Great point, though. Okay, and another question from Vincent Bombayle. Uh, olfactory perception uh, is known to be affected by stress and disease. Uh, he wonders, may have missed this detail, but was this possibility taken into account? Um, I suppose not, I would say not explicitly. However, again, if we were having, um, if there was an effect of those tumors on olfactory perception, it would really only have caused a problem for us if there was an interaction between treatment. So again, we would have expected to maybe see differences in those positive or negative trials um, between the disease, sorry, between the tumor bearing and control animals. Because we didn't have that, we don't really have any reason to believe that that was always driving effect. It's the differences were only in those ambiguous trials, which really does make it seem like it's probably affect that's sort of driving those changes. But another really great point. Uh, another point is from Louis Evans. Um, uh, he she had noticed you for this interesting talk. And but are you hoping that these results? will influence the guidelines around inducing tumors and other disease-like states in animals in the name of medical research, since you have identified negative affective states in these mice? 
I mean, I think I really hope that it triggers more investigation into these states. So this is sort of like a first effect. To our knowledge, it's the first evidence of pessimism in tumor-bearing animals. There's different types of cancer research, but um, I think it should raise concerns and maybe suggest that. So essentially welfare guidelines for oncology often focus on signs of maybe more severe pain or discomfort. So changes in body condition, inflammation, um, things like that. And I think it maybe raises the flag that we need to be investigating some more subtle changes. So maybe, I mean, I, I wish, I certainly hope down the line that it, that things like this could have an impact, but I definitely think the first step will be sort of triggering more research, looking into these subtle changes a little closer. Um, and linking to that, I, I have myself a question. Um, mm -hmm. How could the use of, of multiple uh, ambiguous cues uh, near positive and near negative be useful in future uh, research and, and perhaps that is linked to the previous question. Yeah, that's another great point. So we're we're hoping to replicate this in a current cohort of mice that we have this summer and hoping to use near positive and near negative cues. And this is great for two reasons. One, if you have those near positive and near negative cues, it's a little bit easier to tell whether maybe that odor mixture that you presented first actually just seemed more closer to your positive or negative cue that you provided. So it gives you a little bit more data or range to look at. But then also with judgment biases, the use of near positive and near negative cues actually sometimes allows to distinguish between different types of positive or of negative emotions. So um, differences in anxiety and depression in those responses to those near positive and near negative cues. So potentially opening doors to answer a lot more questions as well. Okay, and, and now the last question from Carol Fures. Uh, great job, Eileen. Did you check that preferred or non-preferred rewards were indeed preferred or not for each tested individual? And if yes, did you get some mice going opposite to the prediction? And if so, how many? Um, great point. So we did confirm our preferences. We ran pilots to assess treat preference um, and to choose our treats. And then during our training phases, we confirmed that preference, making sure that the latency to dig when their high value reward was present was significantly shorter than for the low value reward, and that was true for all mice, um, and we had a highly significant effect. I I can't say for sure whether there was a couple outliers. Um, it's possible that there were, but or, or not true statistical outliers, but maybe a couple individual differences, but fairly strong effect overall. They seem to really like the banana chips they were provided. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Eileen, for all uh, responding to all these questions. You, you had quite a few. Um, so we may now reach the time to uh, finish this uh, session. Uh, let me first acknowledge and, and thank especially to the four presenters uh, today, Kate, Daniel, Andrea, and Eileen. Thank you for um, giving your uh, results. Also on behalf of uh, you four, uh, thank all attendees to this session. And now uh, you may have uh, 40 minutes before the start of the third and last session for today. Uh, you can take this time to visit the posters uh, and, and, and have a look on all the offer of posters of, of this. That, there are quite a few as well. Again, thank you all for attending and hope to see you back in 40 minutes for the last session. Bye bye.